wonderful to be in this room again and be with you for this year. It's been been a while, but I was away for a year, and then Corona restricted access to us jointly, you know, coming up together for discussion. So it's a really privilege and, and, and for me a great joy to be back in this room with you and with the new cohort of fellows. So let us go um, to to go to the next slide. We probably going to do, I think, for this term we see, you know, how COVID is uh, treating us and how far we could get with our in person meetings, you know, we are set up in a hybrid form, but still, you know, although being partly, um, partly virtual in terms of our uh, events, let me acknowledge and uh, with respect in the Kwong and peoples on whose traditional territory, the university stands in the song is Kwong and the Sanj peoples whose historical relationship um, with the land continues to this day. You will see throughout the term, uh, we will explore what this means, this relationship, the legacy of colonialism, which will be an um, integral part of what we do here at the center. Today, however, we shift to a slightly different topic. And um, if you could, uh, could, oh no, Esther, before I introduce Miriam, let me, uh, those of you online, um, could you go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, just the etiquette, I think we are all used to it by now. We're all Zoom creatures, um, how to keep your um, microphones muted and uh, then you can join us afterwards. Um, best would be wave your virtual hand or just let me know that you would like to come in. So we make this hopefully as ex inclusive as possible with people on screen here. Um, could you go to the last slide? Before I introduce Miriam one further, just a heads up that we have a uh, you know, co-sponsored event, I think it's co-sponsored by us, uh, event today um, on campus uh, with the uh, Education session on pig cooking and regeneration of the Kwang food system with Cheryl Bryce, uh, Patrick Schief, and maybe Craig and Jeff Corta. So that's be uh, that'll be at one o'clock. So if you want to join us for this, it's across from the first people's house, right? Yeah, so right on campus. Um, and then uh, we have more importantly our welcome back coffee. So we'll be busier in here next week. And then uh, Jody, do you if you want to speak about the song these um, canoe tour. Mm -hmm. So um, Amanda's taking some um, uh, RSVP. RSVPs for the Song Peace Canoe Tour. It's open to anyone, um, but we need to know pretty soon if you're going to come. This, the first vote's about 15 people. They do a really incredible tour of the Inner Harbor and talk about the um, the alternate histories that we sometimes don't know here in Victoria. So there's a, a wonderful display of pictures that are down there and they give a real good context to it. And then we paddle in the boat together and go across and look at some of the um, the, uh, the stuff in the inlet that's there and, and kind of anchor and see about the thriving community that lived here 100 years ago. So everyone's welcome, but just let us know. Wonderful. And you can see, you know, already heads up about a talk in a week from now, Legacy on Exploitation, Early Capitalism in the Red River Colony, uh, talk by Susan Deanne uh, Brophy. So that's it, and if you could go to the second last slide, which gives me the great pleasure of introducing Miriam. And Miriam, I'm not sure whether this is true, but the uh, the myth is that you are the first co to tail PhD on campus. So it was a real pleasure meeting Miriam now over 10 years ago, and uh, basically, walking her through the bureaucratic nightmare of setting this up. So she now holds a dual PhD from the University of Victoria and the Free University in Berlin. And you know, it was, it's was been a wonderful experience once we got everything sorted out to work with Miriam over the years, as, as I said. She's been here as a fellow and has excelled in her career in Germany. And now, as you can see, uh, not only holds a professorship at the University of Applied Sciences of Erfurt, but herself is a head of a research center uh, countering the effects of radicalization, violent conflict, and social professions. And in this broader field, I suppose, is your uh, presentation for today, whose title is How to Beat, um, BFF, Best, um, how we, uh, Frenemies Forever, the Paradox um, Relationship of Jihad and Right-Wing Extremism uh, that occupies you, and particularly the right-wing extremism, as I understand it, um, in European context, but you have this expertise more, far more broadly. That's how you started off um, looking at jihadism in parts of Africa, sub Saharan Africa. So I'm very curious to hear about your current research and welcome back, most of all.
Well, thank you so much, um, Oliver, for this uh, really <clears throat> kind introduction. And thank you so much, um, Jody and Amanda, for setting all this up and hosting me here again at CFGS. Um, well, I'll just uh, jump right in and um, hope that all questions you might have can be clarified along the way and also during my presentation. So I hope you can see this all right. And uh, also see there will be some videos in there. So the people at home, in case you don't really hear everything, you may ask questions after, like, like after the videos, of course. So um, I thought I would just kick off with a question and, well, some kind of input to you all, because that is a sticker I found in my hometown a couple of months ago. Um, as you can see, there is a picture in the middle of a blonde woman representing, um, well, the white female of the West and um, on the left and right hand side, according to clothing, um, you can see orthodox, um, well, orthodox oriented Muslim people that actually usually are associated with Salafism, but that's not the same thing. We can talk about this a bit later. So, and the sticker says, integrate white woman, because this is not your home anymore and never will be again. Dress with more respect towards other cultures and consider the feelings of religious minorities. Everyday racism starts with the way you dress. So, and my question for you is now like a guessing game, pretty much what kind of political orientation do you think the author has who produced this sticker and this like, actually it was a huge poster produced all over Germany and Austria and you could find in many places. Maybe someone of you has an idea. Anti-immigrant. Yeah, well, that is actually sums it up. Thank you. I know it's actually, it is pretty self-evident that it's anti-immigrant, but actually some people in public lectures would say, well, there was like, really that's, that's Muslims who do that. Well, because we know that's not true, but other people would think that. And that's actually what it was designed for. It was published by a right-wing YouTuber. And uh, well, so you find many of these things and many of these examples, how, um, right-wing extremism and jihadi Salafism speak to one another. And um, this is my topic for today. And I hope after the talk, you will like find more connections and also friction between those two movements. I'll be talking a little bit about methodology and analysis, but will not do too much of it. Look into groups of the extreme right, jihadi Salafism, and then go into the narratives that actually connect these two social movements. So, well, I just started with this kind of hate relation relationship between the two movements. And I think you're aware of that, that they're using one another to actually, um, well, to cause unity among them and have like a clear picture of the so-called enemy. But what they also have been doing these past recent years is that they're getting somehow friendlier to one another. So I'll just try to sum it up for you very briefly that like for, for jihadi Salafism, um, they consider themselves to be the, like, to offer the only true and valid interpretation of Islam, a version that any Muslim is obliged to follow and promote through violence. I'm saying that explicitly because it is a political ideology, is not really a religion if we look closer. According to jihadi Salafism, all Muslims have to live according to the rules and values of their imagined community um, modeled and what they believe had been the reality of, well, the Prophet Muhammad's first society community in Yathrib, in Medina. So for the group of the so-called Islamic State, and I'm talking a little bit more about this group, this means the establishment of a worldwide empire um, with this violence turning first and foremost against the westernization of Muslim societies. Muslim women play a very important role here too, and uh, women from the uh, so-called West as well, but I'll get a little bit more into that later. So the ultimate goal of jihadi Salafism is a revolutionary change of the world as we know it. Looking at the far right, that actually is a similarity. I will come back to that later. However, we first and foremost think of racism and anti-Semitism if we're talking about the far right. However, what they also have been doing recently is um, creating a new enemy and um, the major enemy being a narrative against uh, Muslim minorities and communities. Um, so they're referring to the historic Muslim um, and Western uh, relationship in the Middle Ages and creating a new narrative around a Muslim invasion to Europe, which has started to take hold among many parts of the population during the so-called refugee crisis in 2014. So 
many of you might, um, oh, sorry, that was the pictures for uh, the jihadi Salafist idea of the caliphate. Many of you might remember these um, images. So it was not just about refugees welcome in Europe. It was also about like pushing refugees out and um, how the far right actually instrumentalized that to draw more and more people from the so-called political uh, center towards this kind of idea. So basically these two groups or movements, jihadi Salafism and right-wing extremism are considered to be arch enemies. However, very like recently there has been a change in that relationship, which has also historical roots. And we can look into that a little bit. So I have an example very recently. I'm a quote from Jihadi Sid, who says, other people were aware of this evil doctrine, Zionism, and they did things to stop it, like Adolf Hitler. That is a very easy, you know, reference that you can find among Jihadi Salafists, but it's out there. And then, um, like taking this like hint to national socialism, I won't do that a lot today, but we need it a little bit. Um, looking back into um, national socialist history in Germany, find many, many quotes where actually there was this kind of reference made to Islam. However, and that I have to point this out, um, these references actually were like focused on jihadi Salafism, which is, as I said, um, what you would consider a politi uh, political religion or religious um, ideology, depending on how you theorize it. So the reference here is not referring to the world religion of Islam, but the interpretation of um, jihadi Salafists more or less. So I have a quote from SS leader and Minister of Interior of the Third Reich, Heinrich Himmler, who was actually speaking to the Muslim soldiers of the Bosnian division um, in June 1944. And he had to say, I don't hold anything against Islam. In this division, Islam inspires its soldiers, promising the reward of heaven for their sacrifice. This is a pragmatic religion, very well suited for soldiers. So let it stand there and just want to point out again, um, the Islam they're referring to is not the Islam that is a world religion. So, um, well, after like this introduction, we find other uh, moments of sympathy, sympathy between the far right and the, the jihadi Salafists, and they learn from one another. On the left hand side, there is an Instagram post, Jihad in my heart. On the right hand side, a group will come to later. Uh, the Atomwaffen Division, who is uh, like calling for white jihad. Um, and very recently, there was a congratulation by the Proud Boys. If white men in the West had the same courage as the Taliban, we would not be ruled by Jews currently. As you can see, they're also throwing together like uh, Taliban, jihadi Salafism. There is differences here, so they're not that differentiated. But still, um, I mean, that is pretty strong uh, stuff. To be honest, the Taliban is epic, was a vlogger of the far right who was close to the 6th of January attack on the White House. So um, I hope you pretty much get the picture and especially on uh, this day today, 20 years after the 9-11 attacks. So Proud Boys uh, last year congratulated um, the jihadi Salafist attack by celebrating 9-11 with those kinds of pictures. So you might know now why I got curious to look more into this kind of relationship. So how am I going to do this? Um, very briefly, um, the first thing I like think is very important that I consider the far right and jihadist Salafism social movements. Uh, their main goal is social change. And um, very briefly, I consider social movements, social processes that include mechanism enabling collective action just to push this forward. This is still the weakest part of research, so I'm just starting to uh, interconnect the theoretical approach of social movements with other aspects. You'll see that later. I'll focus on the central mechanisms, according to Diani and um, Della Porta, um, where there is a conflict situation which defines opponents which also means you have othering or an in and out group production. There's actors creating a distinct identity, which makes a connection or creates a connection between people and actors forming close informal networks. So the basis of this is communication. I interconnect this with three dimensions of social groups because social movement theory allows me for looking at like social groups as a unit of analysis 
but still being open enough to see the, the movement or also the exchange between different groups and the social movement that basically feeds into groups and people just can drop out, go back into the movement and find another group they feel connected to. So looking into um, social theory on groups, um, I will focus into the, on the ideology, um, strategy and means and organization of uh, the social movements and the groups that emerge from that. Today, I will mostly focus on ideology, but not ex uh, exclusively, and connect it with, um, well, uh, the ideas we just looked at before at the process of formation of social movement. We can identify the conflict situation as part of the ideology, which is translated into strategy. We can find the actors that are connected by and communicate through informal networks, which means organization, and how they feel connected by their distinct identity that also feeds into ideology and organization. So those of you who know me a little know that I love social theory. So there's some theory behind it, um, tapping into um, theory on religious ideology. This is just one example. Uh, Durkheim's Die Elementaren Form des Religiösen Lebens, where I also see connections between collectively shared beliefs in religion, beliefs that are realized in shared practices, and community that actually is created through shared beliefs and practices. And that is actually a characteristic that you see with religious ideologies, and which is also differentiating them a little bit from just political ideologies, that you find a transcendent moment in there and a legitimization beyond what we think of as the mundane. Um, I won't go too much into that, it would take too much time. More importantly, what am I going to do now with those groups? How do I look into them? So what I can do, what I think I can do, considering it as political ideologies, I will look at the diagnosis of the ideology, the solution and the goal, and you will find in there ideology, strategy and organization. So diagnosis, what is the problem? seeing the diagnostic framing. What is the solution? How can this problem be eliminated? How do we realize this solution through strategy with a collective rule of the group, um, a kind of elite vanguard where this problem no longer exists and the individual role is the solution where everyone who is involved in that just feels like a chosen one, like a select person. And the goal usually is to reach this ideal state, a utopia where the problem no longer exists. It's both the memory framing, like justifying your actions and the motivational framing, looking to the future. So, and all this underlies the idea that groups are created as social spaces and narratives through communication and in practice through action and interaction in relation to what is unifying everyone inside and homogenizing the people's ideas on the inside and excluding non-members on the outside. So as brief as possible, and now to the like more fun stuff, as I think, my examples, um, starting with groups of the far right, um, just a little other um, addition on what I'm going to do today, like how did I choose the groups um, from both sides, the far right and jihadi Salafism, because there's so many of them. Um, I put them in like three categories, the groups that would just um, to, to realize their goal, they would threat like to, to commit violence and have a violent rhetoric, but still be part of the existing political system. They would not openly challenge the system and always try to be somewhere on the sidelines and being some kind of hero who rescues the currently kind of weak system. Then we have the limited violence at the fringes and that are going beyond the legal system. They still have the pretense of support of the failing system, but they actually tend to go beyond it. And then we have those that actually finally say, okay, that's it. We are openly challenging the system to abolish it. And we resort to unlimited violence, to terrorist violence to reach our goal. So the first thing I'm going to start with is the pretense of conformity. Um, so we mostly focus on those two kinds of groups that are actually still like that already challenge the existing system. And <clears throat> I wanna look at the soldiers of voting as a group that's actually having a global like like claims to be a global movement just like the so-called islamic state um you all know i usually call the group daesh won't go into that why but today just call it the islamic state um just similar like the so-called islamic state called like claimed to be um a global 
a global group, a global movement. So the soldiers of Odin um, basically seized the window of opportunity of 2015 when people started to get worried um, that there might actually be too many people from the Middle East coming to Europe. All of you know that this hasn't started in 2015 like that. It had been going on for over two decades and there's many, many reasons, one of them being uh, European um, agrarian uh, politics and um, things that relate also to the food crisis of the early 2000s that created people like the reasons for people to leave and also uh, conflicts and other uh, many other reasons. So I won't go into that, but in 2015, you remember lots of people tried to actually escape war and also atrocities, uh, especially in Syria, but also Iraq and later on um, Afghanistan. So um, we have this like win uh, window of opportunity for many right wing groups to basically, um, well, jump on that wagon and use it, use people's fears and uh, go out in the streets and, and ask for um, something to make people more safe. And um, in the summer of 2017, there was an anti-immigrant group in Finland, a very small one, uh, that organized itself with the slogan, close the border, which was um, actually, the border was closed, so whatever they thought, but people basically thought, well, we have open borders and everybody can come and they, they use people's fears. And we have this like really uh, young uh, lad called Mika Ranta, and no one actually knew him at the time, like he was just a regular white dude. Um, and he uh, formed um, a group called the Soldiers of Odin. He just had left the Somen Vastarantilike, the Finnish resistance movement, an extremely right-wing extreme white right wing party, and formed this movement. Um, and the idea was to protect uh, like Western women from attacks by obviously dangerous, uh, migrants from uh, North Africa and the Middle East. So, and well, who would have guessed? They found a lot of people who sympathized with that. There were some incidences in Germany, we can talk about that later, um, where women were attacked. And of course, these things just blew out of proportion and fed into that narrative. So this is where he came from. So you can see, oh, sorry, just wait for a little bit, um, where he came from a very small, um, very small uh, town in Finland, so and was able to actually export his idea all over the world. So there is a big, uh, there was actually some groups in Germany that are still active. There are groups in Canada that are even more active than the original group in Finland right now. So, and um, interestingly on YouTube, we can have a glimpse in their lives. So I did that to like, you know, see a little bit about what is this all about? What is so fascinating about, about this group? Um, well, basically, they're just having like family like gatherings, barbecues, community uh, service. And uh, also, um, they would be patrolling the streets at night and um, have this kind of like brotherhood going on. And that reminded me pretty much of a TV show, some of you might know, The Sons of Anarchy, um, that is also about a motorcycle club. And interestingly, what this uh, show did, it rehabilitated outlaw motorcycle clubs. Uh, in North America and Europe. Women and family are introduced as the main driver for these broken heroes, and you will find a good heart underneath the rough exterior of each murderer, drug dealer, or rapist. And um, interestingly enough, uh, like in this TV show, men would take the law into their own hands, and justice is to be found only beyond the law. So um, Clearly, the Odin, Odins um, can rely on those cultural scripts of those motorcycle clubs, but they were doing something else that has been a real success among the far right globally. Um, so there you can see similarities with different um, advertisements. But what they also did, they referred to uh, Scandinavian lore, so Norse sagas, including this like spiritual world of Vikings another TV show, and you would find many alliterations and, and metaphors using the TV show. They're not using um, religion, because there is a practice religion out there, people that actually live this kind of belief, but they have nothing to do with right-wing extremists. They basically play mix and match with those images and ideas. And to like make you connect a little more with this kind of, with their world, um, I found a video clip 
that would um, introduce, well, the most important figure, Odin, who's also the name giver for this group, as the Norse god of war, who provides uh, participatory frames, that is, diverse possibilities of identification. Odin is the warrior and the wanderer, which translates as the master of ecstasy and rage. And, um, well, I have a, a clip where obviously Odin himself is speaking uh, to his constituency. I hope uh, the audio is working now. May the women walk safely again upon the streets of our land. The wolf does not fear the slithering snakes which come. It does not worry of offending when it strikes bad. It does not ask permission to defend its young. May the soldiers of Odin find victory in bringing safety back to our cherished land. May our enemies feel Odin's protection and fall swiftly at his warrior's hand. The wandering one is told that the soldiers of Odin are starting chapters in every state of the U.S. I personally believe this to be a good thing, and this I openly confess. I believe it is good to see some balls in America, even if they need to be imported these days. Though, this is probably frowned upon by Obama's Muslim Brotherhood, who rules the NSA. So there is more uh, interesting video material of them marching uh, to like uh, specifically produce metal music. Um, well, it's not about the metal music, it's about the content. So I'll just leave that out for now. But those of you who heard um, the like that kind of poem, first of all, Odin is said to be speaking only in verses, just to add that. So, and that poem basically said, um, it's time for us to like to rise against this kind of, again, conspiracy theory. Um, like President Obama being a member of the Muslim Brotherhood and all these kinds of ideas um, that are interwoven in here. But the main message is we had to import, import balls in America from Scandinavia and finally got the balls to do something about it. So um, what I'm going to do now is starting to look at the belief systems and Odin's belief system, we have a diagnosis. So what's the problem? The problem like, from a right-wing extremist perspective is still pretty tame, but it's also like sad and worrisome because they see cultural heterogeneity in society, so pluralism, and they don't like it because differences in societies cause conflicts, especially Islamization endangers the Occidental culture and the strength of the existing national communities. So you see, we're also mo already moving into the direction of the Proud Boys. The solution right now is um, not to throw anyone out, but rather to protect our citizens and defend our streets. That's what Facebook's page at the time said in 2016. The goal was more safety in our streets by violence or the threat of violence against foreigners where the police couldn't do the job anymore, like properly. And um, I picked the soldiers of Odin because they were very popular with the press at the time. There was lots of like journalists that actually were interested in them and reporting about them and like, well, they're like kind of this brave neighborhood watch, but obviously they're not. And um, the question is, can I actually put them with a right wing movement? And I will show you that I can, because um, you can already see that in this logic. But I looked a little bit into um, the idea of pan Scandinavia, where you have connections <clears throat> to the first ideas of these soldiers of Odin. And we just talked about uh, the fact that the founder of the soldiers of Odin had been part of the SVL. So I looked into the ideas of Henry Kolapa, who founded this party, and he said, Hitler's Germany corresponds exactly with my vision of a utopian society. The ideology does not need any additions or deletions. So 
again, I think that's really pretty blunt, so we don't have to worry about putting the soldiers of Odin there. But let's look at his, um, well, his logic of his belief system. What does he say? Pluralism destroys the unity of society and thus endangers Europe's strength, European strength. It's not just about conflict, it's about like biological questions that this might actually endanger the purity of the Nordic race. Islam is the animal of, any enemy of the occidental culture and plans to destroy it. The solution is not only to take law and order in your own hands, but you have to defend the democratic state and finally destroy it because it's too weak to uphold this racial, biological and ethnic based elitism. And you are selected to become the hero of your own story here if you're joining in this kind of fight. So um, I basically don't see much difference between the SVL and the soldiers of Odin, only that the SOO was like covering their original logic and ideology a little bit better. But moving on from like the SVL's diagnosis and they're not doing too much about it in the open, I found another group that I want to look at with you and you probably know them, uh, the Atomwaffendivision. Um, they again um, refer to the so-called Third Reich in Germany, that hence the German name, but uh, they actually I think don't know much about National Socialism itself. Um, it was founded in 2016 out of the banned forum Iron March and is exceptional in terms of the excessive violent rhetoric and glorification of violence and also terrorist activities. Um, ideology and strategy are both influenced by the writings of the neo-Nazi pre-generation of the United States, particular James Mason, who describes terrorist attacks and lone wolf terrorism as a preferred mode of action. Um, you can find them even in Germany. Um, there is several people who are part of a group called uh, Nationale Aufbau Eisenach or Knockout 51 that were proven to have connections to uh, the um, AWD. So they're part of the ideology of white supremacists. And I summarized that a little bit for you, which makes it even clearer what, what we're looking at. So the diagnosis that we have racial superiority of the Aryan race, I'm including here socially constructed, but that's what they believe. So we have a biological purity that's destined to mandate and rule the world, um, where mixing with inferior races endangers this um, purity. And there's also, again, Jewish world conspiracy who are basically orchestrating the change of the world as we know it now. And solution is to destroy the enemies to realize the right to rule the world, the natural order of things. And the most important thing here is the goal. Um, how to reach that goal? To provoke an apocalyptic war among the races, apocalyptic anarchy, where only one side will be victorious or the world ends. I would like you to hold that thought because now we're moving to the other movement, uh, which is uh, jihadi Salafism. And um, well, we already had some references here, but uh, first of all, before we uh, go into that. I want to look at the social movement itself and then into uh, one group more specifically. First and most important, th important thing for me here is to um, make a really cl clear where the differences between Islam and Salafism are. Islam as a world religion where you have an acceptance of various interpretations of the Holy Quran and the practice of belief among most Muslims. So pluralism actually is part of this religion. There's a variety of uh, denominations and opinions of re religious scholars. And of course they're fighting who's about who's right, but there's basically, as I said, an acceptance. Islam like allows for a contextualized reinterpretation of faith within like what is given in Holy Quran in time and place. Salafism, on the other hand, as a religious ideology, claims monopoly on interpretation of Holy Quran and practice of faith. And um, it is an offshoot of a highly politicized minority position of one specific 13th century scholar, Ibn Tamiya, who also inspired Saudi Arabia's Wahhabism. Salafism claims absolute and unambiguous truths and jihadi Salafism claims that the only way to realize this is through violence. If there's any questions about that, I will go into that later. And which is really unfortunate is that Jihadi Salafism and specifically these so-called Islamic State, they draw from 
practices of Muslim faith and abuse it for political ends, just like um, the um, uh, just uh, like on this flag here, um, there is no God but God and Muhammad is God's prophet, which is the Muslim creed being abused um, on this um, on this flag. And this also means for people, it's getting more and more difficult to differentiate between this, um, well, political version and the actual religion. So what I did here is looking into Syed Qutb's um, diagnosis. Um, and again, it's, well, it would be too much detail to look into what's the difference between the Muslim Brotherhood and Jihad Salafism and other groups themselves, but I wanted to have a representative. So it's open to critique that I've done that. But basically his diagnosis um, and being the chief ideologue of the Ihwan al muslimin he basically established um, a lot of these ideas. There's a critique of Western dominance of the Muslim world. Capitalism and socialism are responsible for cultural decline of Islam and its society. Jahiliya, the time of ignorance and darkness before the revelation of Prophet Muhammad has returned. Muslims as Democrats are committing idolatry, which is shirk, something to be shunned, um, actually destroying the unity of the Ummah, the one community of Muslims, and like the reason for strife, fitna among the Muslim community. And the solution is that the Jahiliya can only be ended by a Muslim vanguard, ideas that have been inspired both by, um, well, Marxism, if we look into, uh, into the writings of, Ibn, uh, of Said Qutb, but also by authors like Alexis Carell, who can be found on the right wing side. So the vanguard here that is actually needed is modeled on the Salaf Salah, the, the peers forefathers. Um, this is where the name Salafism comes from. So the goal is, in the end, to establish a system of Islamic governance, hence the name Islamic State doesn't mean they want to create a state, they want to create a caliphate that actually overcomes the like community of nation states as we know it today. And this is only uh, possible through resistance and violence. Um, so that was a very brief summary and, as I said, open to discussion. What is the difference with the Islamic State now? They're not part of the Muslim Brotherhood and we're looking into that group. Um, you remember like the times when they first, um, well, they first came into being and um, basically declared a caliphate when their well self-declared caliph said, the time has come for those generations that were drowning in oceans of disgrace, being nursed on the milk of humiliation and being ruled by the vilest of all people after the long slumber and the darkness of neglect, the time has come for them to rise. In Arabic, it actually sounds much nicer. And again, in verse, so there's something similar to be found here. Um, we find that in um, that kind of diagnosis in Qutb's writings as well, the diagnosis that Al-Jahiliya has returned. And the solution offered here is the realization of God's sovereignty and the openness of the Ummah within the Islamic State um, as a global caliphate, Dawlat Islamiyah. So caliphate here is based on the Salafist interpretation of the oneness of God, which does not allow for any political system that might challenge that idea. So it's a specific a concept of monotheism that is presented here. What he also said is, we hereby clarify to all Muslims that with this declaration of the Khilafah, it is incumbent upon them to swear allegiance to and support the Khalifa Ibrahim, may Allah protect him. Uh, the legitimacy of the rule of Emirates groups, states and organizations expires everywhere with the expansion of the Caliphate's authority and the arrival of its troops. So clearly it says, we, as the so-called Islamic State, we claim um, to be the leaders, not only of the Muslim world, but also of all the other jihadi Salafist groups. Um, and he, you can find this here. Do not think the war we are waging is the Islamic State's war alone. Rather, it is the Muslims' war altogether. It is the war of every Muslim in every place. And the Islamic State is merely the spearhead. Sounds pretty much to me similar to many other writings about uh, vanguard parties in this war. It is but the war of the people of faith against the people of disbelief. And of course, the Islamic State defines who is disbelievers and those who are punished the most, remember that, is fellow Muslims who would not follow their idea of creed. So 
we find that the solution is actually kind of sophisticated. You want to realize the caliphate through a jihadist struggle, that means terrorist attacks on the ground or in exile societies, a departure to the caliphate as soon as it was established, and to join the fight in apocalyptic battles. The role of the group basically is the vanguard as the elitist spearhead, and the role of the individual is either to become a martyr by death in battle, um, or to be, well, what you um, consider a jihadist, a lifelong fighter. And the strategy, and this is where it comes all together, is the management of savagery um, with a goal, the violent establishment of the version of the caliphate, its consolidation and perpetual expansion. So you might wonder, what is that management of savagery? Where did that come from? So it's a book uh, written by synonym Abu Bakr Naji. So far, I haven't figured out who that actually really is. There's some theories. And he's not part of the so-called Islamic State, but he wrote a very like influential strat strategic book um, on how to finally establish a caliphate, saying that the only way to do that is um, through the stage of vexation and exhaustion, um, jihadists have to create a situation of savagery and chaos civil war, eternal strive to provoke an apocalyptic situation which will culminate in their total victory or their total surrender. And that sounds pretty much like what we just learned about the Atombachen Division, to have this like apocalyptic final battle where, well, the righteous will prevail in the end. So, I will leave out this example in case you're interested. Um, there's a group in Germany that did something similar to the soldiers of Odin, keeping safe Muslim women um, on the streets and um, also trying to bring back um, those who actually, as they thought, might not follow Muslim creed as they wanted them to, to bring them back on the right path. So they wanted to basically prevent good Muslims from doing bad deeds. They would use again and abuse concepts of a Muslim belief to, well, to have this kind of legitimization and um, well support German police in uh, basically doing their work how they figured best, but leave out that example today and come to the narratives, because I think that actually might be interesting to use to see how we can actually find similar narratives in both ideologies that also play out in their strategies. Um, just a reminder, what I talked about, we'll be looking at the narratives, communication, and practice, action, and interaction. So the, I divided it in two things and in two sections, starting with us for what's ours, constructing community through unambiguous gender roles on the inside. The other thing I will be looking at is narratives, um, creating identity to the outside. So, um, First of all, it's based on the people's community, Volksgemeinschaft, for the right wings, and the Umma, the version of the Umma, which is supposedly homogeneous for jihadi Salafists, which defines any affiliation primordially, meaning that is replacing family ties. So you can become part of a bigger family if your family doesn't love you anymore. You have a new family. In the sense of blood relationship, kinship, the us is constructed and it is based on unambiguous gender roles. And I think that's the most important point here because it is also an antidote for the crisis of the male of postmodernity, because that's something that basically unifies all those groups and movements and men joining that, um, this kind of like being faced with, um, well, these new roles that actually are not as easy to access as they used to be. So what we find is a role for men that is between brotherhood and a holy mission to protect, to protect their own, to protect their women, to protect their children. We find father-son narrative, we find a brotherhood narrative, a little bit of a sisterhood narrative too, interestingly, protect a narrative with a home holy mission and um, which can only be defined in relation to the unambiguous female role. Just to have to catch up with my script so I'm not getting carried away. So starting with a brotherhood narrative, on the left-hand side, you have camaraderie. It doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be real. Those of you who watch the show, those are two main characters from the show Vikings. So this kind of feeling like 
like a real man living again, like a Viking. Interestingly, there's a connection possible with North America because of the legend of the Vikings um, discovering the United States and the North American continent first. And on the right hand side, you have a joint street dawa, which means um, missionary work um, of the Brotherhood on the streets of Germany. <clears throat> What we also find is a sister narrative. Women usually are not looked at a lot, but I think that's a big mistake, uh, even though they're not as prominent, but they're just as important, maybe even more important than having men in those groups. On the left-hand side, we have the female alpha wolf, a Facebook account, and it says Mothers Against Violence, so the role of the mother. On the right-hand side, you see a group of young women um, well dressed in clothing that you would also find uh, on the Arab Peninsula. So that's this kind of fashion that was introduced by uh, mostly Saudi Arabia, who are this kind of like, you know, um, they're pretty much like the US for for uh, the West in some <coughs> terms, having this kind of fashion style with regard to, um, well, Salafist, but also Orthodox Muslims. So in, more interesting is the subtitle Friends Till Jannah. Jannah means paradise. So will friends forever, sisters forever. So the protector narrative, um, we already heard that in verses, um, to protect their young and their own, to accompany young women and keep them safe from, well, attacks by dangerous Muslim men, like the enemy on the other side, um, bringing them back home safely. And of course, women here are victims. They are like, don't have agency, they need to be protected. Father-son narrative is also interesting. On the left-hand side, you can see like um, the connection between father and son, the son being giving the same kind of clothing, uh, mimic mimicking his dad's stance, and of course, being introduced to the kind of ideology and perspective on life. And here I included a video that was recorded by Vice News. I'm really grateful for their work, which is really dangerous to go there. Um, and um, I really think this section uh, says it all, like what to expect um, also with uh, regard to um, what might happen to the families. That's something that is not really covered so far in part of my work, because um, social workers are really concerned about uh, female returnees with their kids from the so-called caliphate and the same problems with um, right-wing extremist milieus to actually reach out to the children. so that brings us to the other narrative um before we go that just a glimpse into the uniforms i don't want to go too much into detail here but basically um jihadi salafism has similar clothing religious clothing that also orthodox um, Muslims may wear, makes it different, uh, difficult to differentiate, but they also just love uniforms, as you can see here, and with a picture of the AWD as well. And what is also striking is that the only one showing face is the self-proclaimed leader. They're usually 15 to 20, sometimes more years older, and the young men uh, flogging around that, like this male model, who uh, basically role model, who is leading them into battle. Um, so I wanted to look at the role of women with you um, because that is actually the most interesting thing we can find here. It's between Madonna Whore and the nourishing mother, which unifies in and outside and connects the inside with the outside narratives. Um, for both social movements, femininity is defined according to sexual availability. So either you're unmarried, so you're available and fertile, uh, and fertile and female, or you're married, but then you are the mother, you're ethereal beyond the mundane, you're pure, you're a puzzle, you're holy, you're an angel, you're a mother to be. However, any unexpected or unaccepted behavior will remove the female from this place, from this ethereal beyond the mundane and reinstall here, her in the here and now, like her becoming the fallen angel, 
which justifies punishment, what I call the Madonna whore narrative. And we find it on both sides. Like um, you find this like blonde woman with the uh, Identitäre Bewegung, which says too beautiful for the veil. And you find um, on the Instagram account here, uh, the Pearl of Islam. That's actually a picture you find in Islam in general. But in this case, um, due to clothing and also the account I found it with, it means like the sheltered pearl that is perfect and has to be kept safe from the outside world. So you also find the role of the female in the ideal, in the gentleness, purity and consolation. On the left hand side, it's a, a short video clip from the Identitäre Bewegung Bavaria, where this like young woman is talking about her children, like she's a girl, as you can see, probably doesn't have any, but like she's this kind of pure, blonde, blue eyed um, girl that has to be protected. And however, she's there to actually console the man after ba battle. And we can see that again with Bird of Jenna Instagram account. I don't know if the author actually is a woman or just a man posing as a woman. A man should act like a child with his wife. Um, and of course, a quote um, from someone who actually backs up this quote. So interestingly, we also find references to eternity and paradise. Um, on the left hand side, again, a picture from uh, the like TV show Vikings. If he isn't worth it to be next to you in battle, he's not worth it to share your bed. So that is this kind of narrative of the independent woman as part of the movement of, of socials, well, soldiers of Odin. In this case, it's uh, from Brothers One for All. They're connected with the soldiers of Odin. And of course, bad girls go to Valhalla with Ragnar. You find the same thing with the jihadi Salafists, the love of jihad till martyrdom do us part. So what we find here is a mutual dependency of gender roles with the goal to save the crisis of the male. Um, both like male and the female are constructed more like on the outside. We have a code of honor, the fighter and protector um, of female purity, faithfulness, and to console the male. In early childhood, they're divided into male and female, and childhood is cut short um, early by the separation. Education is very gender specific, but also sexualized. Uh, girls are encouraged to gentleness, emotion, um, emphasis is on beauty and patience. For the boys, encouragement of violent behavior, suppression of emotion outside the home, emphasis on the external physicality and action. So you have clear rules for day-to-day -day living. So now the us versus the others, our holy mission to fight. Just as important on the inside, you need the enemy on the outside to cause this kind of, or like realize this kind of cohesion on the inside. And also like make sure there's no like deviating opinions inside your group. You have a narrative that shows difference, demonizes and dehumanizes the opponent. Just a reference to uh, Georg Simmel. He who is not for me is against me is one of the greatest, greatest world historical twists in the sociology of religion. Again, you need this kind of like um, eternal or transcendent element in those ideologies. Um, well, that speaks for itself. I think um, we'll just keep going, looking into uh, this one here, because I find it interesting that just very recently, you also find uh, like depictions and ideas of women being part of the battle. Um, with the right-wing extremists, it's um, like only uh, brave women will go to Valhalla because, um, well, the nice women will go to heaven where you don't want to be, right? The other one says, um, victory or Valhalla, um, I'm a shield maiden. On the right-hand side, and that is actually not really representative, on the right top, you find women of the Hansa Brigade, um, which actually existed. Um, females fighting for the Islamic State, but they were the, the exception. And again, Bird of Jenna posing with an AK-47, however, in female garb and not in combat garb. Um, the other thing I would like to point out is that you need to provoke the apocalypse on both sides. And you see that with references to dying in battle, which is an element you find in the Norse saga. So actually death is something you want to aspire to. You want to go to Valhalla, and the same you find in the idea of jihadi Salafism. Deen over dunya, meaning religion is more important than this world, but more like specifically, Jannah is my goal, so paradise is my goal. And you find that with the um, 
sondern äh, Kriegsdivision and Atomwaffendivision. Äh, It's all been at your hand. Don't try to build a new world. Look toward the end. So, and again, something I really like. Um, there is a kind of a obituary on Osama bin Laden, which was created by the Atomwaffen uh, Division. Open your hearts to terror. So, the ultimate enemy we find on both sides is the conspiracy theory of anti Semitism. I'll be very brief looking at the time. So, this is a very classic uh, drawing um, that actually points out the state of Israel as a spider in the net. And most of you who like have lived in the Middle East or are even from there, they know that there is, of course, um, well, reason for critique against the politics of state of Israel, which is has to be differentiated from anti-Semitism here. So um, this depiction is not about politics. This is a this is anti-Semitic, like connecting and and also calling on all the ideas that might be out there um, about the Jewish people that have been well, according to conspiracy theory, orchestrating um, modernity as we know it and basically are able to use politicians as puppets. Again, a reminder of that quote um, to bring it into the present with ISIS member Sidat Adar and finding it on the other side with um, current movements in Europe where you find the octopus everywhere representing capitalism and that's also like a representative of um, Semitic uh, well, or Jewish uh, world conspiracy. And you find it here with Atomwaffendivision that is saying the old order is a kaiki system, meaning a derogatory derogative of Jewish migrants. So, and to give a last glimpse into what happened during COVID, you also find the hashtag COVID-1948 being used by jihadi Salafists and white supremacists where they combined it into a victim narrative. We are the victims here. There is a Jewish conspiracy. They created this virus, and it's pretty much like creating the state of Israel. Um, very interesting conversation, and actually, like, also difficult to wrap your head around this kind of logic. So now I come to my conclusion. There is two dimensions I want to look into. The one is identity, home, and resolution of identity conflicts. So what do these narratives actually do? Um, what they help doing is they give people who join those movements and groups an identity home and solve people's own inner conflicts. So I'm jumping from the group level to the micro level, looking into that. Um, a quote from 17-year-old E, who was a former member of Blood and Honor, who said, it was simply a beautiful thing, beautiful feeling, because before, well, they taunted you, everybody else, but now no one dared to. They evade you and walk the other way, not only because I was on the right, but because they'd heard a hell of a lot about all the stuff I'd been doing. So by having this kind of rite of passage where you actually exceed violence, excessive violence, you join a group. And later on, he would say, but that was also the reason I couldn't leave because everybody knew I did all these things and they would hold me to it. And then also there was the threat from the other members of the group to do the same to me. And you would find that with jihadi Salafists as well. The rite of passage of the so-called Islamic State was holding up the head of your first victim in the camera and posted on Twitter. And that means your whole family, they will not take you back. No one will take you back. No one will want you after that. So you have burned all the bridges um, behind you. And um, the second one, and this is where I'm going to end, is the creation of an alternative reality, which doesn't require any intellectual debate or tolerance of ambiguity, meaning that um, the two, like the groups like Soldiers of Odin, uh, Blood and Honor, and the jihadi Salafists counterparts define and need one another. They have a like, kind of enemy symbiosis, last excursus, because I really like that. You can even find fringe fluidity between them. There's a case of AW Doom member Devin Arthurs, who 2017 converted to Islam, who self-identified as a Salafist socialist and killed some of his fellow um, AWD members because they were actually bad-mouthing his conversion and his idea of Islam. And uh, well, obviously the name doesn't play a big role, as James Mason says, a name disappears and you find another, just like changing your underwear. It simply doesn't mean anything. And there also was a young woman in France uh, where they find several um, items um, after she tried to attack a church. She self identified as a Muslima, but they would find um, pictures 
of right-wing extremist executions, they would find, um, well, a copy of Mein Kampf, and they would also find like posters where uh, former World War II um, atrocities were glorified. So that's actually just, that's not pictures that were found, but it's a representative, what you also can find online. So it's not just men, it's also women you find there. And um, the last anime narrative where I'm gonna end here, because that is also what, what it does do as a result, they unify with an anime narrative um, against modernity, democracy, liberalism, and human rights. And they're so explicit about it. The right hand size as the right hand uh, says, if future demands this of us, we will uh, break your laws on the right uh, top right. There's uh, like the logo of the soldiers of Odin. We will uh, break your laws to protect our children. And the future is banging at the door. Fascism is the solution to the problems that liberalism creates. And also on the right hand side, democracy is a failed system. And um, the last thought here is a quote from Pierre Conessa, former senior official at the French Ministry of Defense and also prefers, a professor at Sciences Po, who is talking about the similarity between the Front National, which is a right-wing movement, and Salafism, where he says, from this point of view, it is surprising to see that the rise of the far right in Europe is analyzed in political debates, while the jihadist insurgency of the Salafists is seen exclusively through a security lens as if the two phenomena were not part of the same political process. And that is something like we haven't really figured out yet and don't really see in many places, especially with security, but also social services um, and social analysis, that both uh, social movements have a social political dimension. They do have an agenda, but they also have a security dimension that has to be addressed. Thank you so much for your attention today. And Ready for your questions. Thank you very much, Miriam. I think when Oliver signed off, you know, he put it very nicely. Uh, very insightful, but disturbing as well uh, to hear about certain of these incidents. Thank you very much for bringing back your research here to the center and give us an update on, on what you've been working on. Um, I would suggest if those online, if you have questions, send us a chat um, message. Um, Joe, you can then alert me if there's a question. Maybe I open up to the room first. We have another 20 minutes or so. Maybe you want to, anyone who wants to start us off. Michael. Yeah, thank you for that. That was wonderful. I think it's such an important topic. There's so much room for exploration in it. I think it's completely uh, too little explored. And I think for many people in the general public, it's probably very counterintuitive or shocking the first hear the analogy of the two, but I mean, all you need to do is like run through and think extremists in both factions tend to be conservative, socially conservative, religious or religious extremists, militant, intolerant, patriarchal, and trying to control women's bodies, right? So obviously parallel. So I have just two simple questions that I wanted to pose. Um, have you seen Adam Curtis's The Power of Nightmares? It's a great documentary where he juxtaposes Syed Kudu with Leo Strauss and shows how they both speak in sort of this conservative extremist doomsday sort of narrative to rally uh, these sort of esoteric uh, subversive movements. And uh, it's interesting too to make the parallel not just with sort of the far right in the US or in, in the West, but with neoconservatism itself. You know, it's well known that neoconservatives from the Reagan administration on Many of the sort of the hardcore neoconservatives, the Straussians, were very much um, uh, envious of the militant, the hardness of those militant jihadis, the Taliban fighters, uh, the Osama bin Laden and his cohorts. And they were very sort of disturbed that their own society was so soft and so, so liberal, so pluralistic, and it was corroding the society. So they had this sort of secret envy of what was going on in these extremist groups in the, uh, in, in the, in the Muslim world. <clears throat> and my last question is, probably, is actually probably pretty controversial, but have you considered the connections as well between um, these extremist conservative movements and Zionism itself? It's maybe a bit more of a stretch, but you know, you think about uh, the Net Netanyahu's affinity with sort of the right wing in Poland. It's strange that you can sort of have these bedfellows who are both anti-Semitic, yet 
friendly with Zionism. And all you need to do is look to, say, uh, all right to uh, guru Richard Spencer, a very vocal admirer of the Israeli system for its extreme nationalistic tendencies and its rejection of pluralism, and even holding up Israel as a model for what the United States should do. So I'm curious if you uh, have looked at the connection between the neocons and the uh, sort of far right extremists in the Muslim world on the one hand, and then what you think about this tie that also uh, brings in sort of uh, ex extremist Zionism that has an affinity with these far right or extremist uh, beliefs. Thank you for all these questions, and I I am glad to like to see that you um, well that you saw that what I did that I just I, I compared I didn't say it's the same right and I I want to see what can we learn by comparing um, and especially because like looking at what how can we use that um, in in preventive work in in also um, well of course security addressing security questions but also addressing the like ongoing polarization we have within our societies but also globally so that's why I'm doing this so thank you um, thank you for the movie I will look it up just wrote it down and neoconservatism uh, conservatism that well makes a lot of sense I would answer that historically because um, if you look into the pre-story before the movement of the so-called um, national socialists, they were able to feed from like a widespread debate in, uh, in well, not only Germany and Austria, but all over Europe that had this like conservativismus idea of, um, and especially was connected also to World War I, that, that democracy and, and also these like new ideas would weaken society and would be the end of of basically Europe as we know it. And the, the early and first ideas of uh, Rassen theory and race theory were not developed by national socialists. So you have this like, op like obvious agreement that you still find with neocons that they're still harboring the, these ideas and they will not move beyond the idea of what is like coming back again as ethno pluralism. That's so like the identitaire bewegung, identitary movement in Europe. They claim, well, we are like open to everything. They would work together with any kind of movement from any country in the world if they just shared the belief that we have to keep our culture separate because that is what actually plurality means and diversity in the world. We have to like freeze culture how it is now. Culture is not allowed to mix. And if you look closely enough, of course, that's the same idea of race, a theory behind it that you like that that people differentiate with regard to their origin and culture, and this is just the same in a way of um, of essentialism that that this is their character and identity, and they're born with that, and they will never change, just like society. So, of course, you can see the parallels there. Um, with regard to Zionism, um, I would rather look into uh, into the strategy because. Um, that's a more complex topic with regard to how would you separate ideology and religion, because of course this is about religion. However, I agree with you with regard to the strategy um, that like you have to homogenize the inside and, and create the big enemy on the outside. And like these mechanisms, they speak to, well, they speak to the idea of the strong male of autarky, of uh, like not needing anyone and like being this in this ultimate endless fight against everybody else. And so I think you find parallels there, but um, would be careful to just do the same as I did with those two movements. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. Everything else next, and Anita, Emmanuel, and I think that we need to close um, the map. Okay. So I have a question about um, theory. There you go, uh, <laughs> methodology. So when you talked about methodology in the middle of the talk, you talked about ideology, an ideological formation. But in your conclusion, you talked about identity. And so throughout the talk, I was thinking, is there a difference here or do you want to draw a difference uh, in the processes that go on here that appeal to identity and identity formation that create identification uh, to whiteness to Islam, to all sorts of, to a, a way of being Muslim, to a way of being white, and ideological uh, connections, which are, I would think are, I mean, maybe there's an umbrella here where ideology is identity, but there's a different thing, which is the Odin people, like they seem to be playing at both. 
uh, and as do the as do the jihadists. They seem to be playing at both, but that there there might be something to separate uh, in that. Um, and I also just recommend, and you know this reading probably is Brubaker and Cooper's Beyond Identity, uh, which is very useful to think about what identity formation is and how it's not how it's different from ideology. Yeah, well, I, you're absolutely right. And that's the thing what I will do when like, uh, like writing it down is um, what also makes the difference is not just the process and what it does, but also that you have this kind of ideological ideal and it's, it's produced to the outside and communicated on the inside, but actually not really followed through. Yeah. So ideology is more the ideal to aspire to and just like with any kind of radical movement um, there's always the excuse we're not there yet this will be the like the ideal in the end until then we have to make sacrifices to our actual um to our actual ideology and these kind of sacrifices they're making you see in the practice and and also in communication like on the inside as far as we can see and this is actually what what is part of identity formation, what you can see on the ground. And, and that is a distinct, oh, that's the differentiation I would make between the two. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's sufficient yet to your question, probably not, mm -hmm. but I'm on it. I promise. Excellent talk, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank We're you. gonna have Miriam back by then. She I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I need to. Thank you so much, Miriam. I really appreciate it, especially all the uh, cultural moves and things that was really uh, fantastic. Um, yeah, to bring back what um, Oliver's land acknowledgement, I think, um, interestingly, colonialism is implicated in this in very profound ways that might nuance our relationship in the room to the lands we're on and thinking of those things. So there, there seems to be a sort of, you know, that the, the original, um, is it Nevenstrom, or like this sort of colonial impulse um, behind the sort of um, spaces that one can exceed oneself. Um, and, and a kind of an originary um, pluralism or diversity in lands that are tied to lands and, and um, nations that exist without these sort of nation states. Conditions. So yeah, just a question about whether colonialism is something you bring in. And the other thing I was going to ask about is, is gender pluralism. Um, when you see these kinds of new movements around uh, women presencing themselves, I like what you were saying about the um, the crisis of the male. One might say in this context, crisis of white male um, cisgender, <laughs> you know, heterosexual male is kind of in the heart of those discourses. So, um, yeah, thinking about plurality in terms of gender is that something you see in their attacks or their moves? Um, well, first to colonialism, it is like a very important part of, well, especially of course, jihadi Salafist narrative, first of all, because um, the ideas that they, they're drawing from, they basically are about being colonized. So 13th century at the time, um, Muslim lands were occupied by a foreign power. So that's what provoked these ideas. And again, it's the feeling that foreign powers and foreign cultures um, basically occupy Muslim lands but also that the Muslim societies themselves are corrupted through uh, westernized ideas and culture. So it's in there. And with right-wing extremists, you have that like interesting turn over the past couple of years that especially like the more like officially more tame movements like the identity movement or the far right, they would say like, they would openly say colonialism was uh, well, the reason for all problems and would even say that if it hasn't been for colonialism, we wouldn't have like migration, we wouldn't have all those problems. If we hadn't had capitalism, we wouldn't have that. So they basically side um, with jihadi Salafists there. And also they do side with Muslims who actually are their enemies. So they would sometimes phrase it like that. Like, I totally understand the people who want to come here because like, um, uh, well, Western pluralism made them. And um, that also gives me a connection to, to the gender perspective, because of course there is like the enemy itself is, because um, there's not all females have the option to become like the pure and, and good woman. If they are part of the liberal democratic project and feminists, they are the enemy. And they're actually like, uh, they're guilty. They're they guilty of like not reproducing 
the nation. And so they are part of the problem on the one hand. And the other thing is, well, women actually have an option to get on the, in their good graces, but everyone who, who identifies as LGBTQ plus doesn't. So um, that is too far outside their like role construction. And of course they have to be punished and they actually are part of the enemy. So um, yeah, that's my answer here. Maybe we collect the two last questions, Emmanuel. Um, can you go first, Mehmet? So with much more basic question, I wondered if you had two parallel stories or if you go beyond the two parallel stories because I understand studying the two movements systematically and I really like the way you do this, but I was wondering if it was in a way, you know, a study of these movements so that you would be able to theorize as to the construction and to know all the things that we discussed about identity, or if actually the, it goes beyond these two. I mean, so um, could you hold up for yeah. just a second and then okay. Matt, and then you can. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll try. Okay, yeah. try. I think mine's pretty easy. It, 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 it's companion to Abigail's in a sense. And I guess it's about uh, rather Abigail is juxtaposing identity and ideology. And I wonder about opportunism and ideology because the frenemies analysis kind of pushes in an opportunist in the direction of pointing to political opportunism. It, it typically um, far right and far left actors often meet each other, right? Like in the 1930s, there's a famous case in New York City um, where a gay um, city councillor was actually paying a far right opponent um, to stage attacks on him and his supporters to whip up his face. Um, this kind of thing goes on in politics. The Proud Boys arguably celebrate 9 11, um, the ones who do, because it's for them the kind of mnemonic, the memory touchstone that they want to use to replace World War II. So we shouldn't worry about Nazism, we need to worry about enemies defending us. And so that's an opportunistic reaction to celebrating 9-11 rather than a kind of, oh, this was a great noble deed. It was 9-11 is convenient to us because it gives us a new mythology uh, of victimization to push back against, right? Um, and in kind of far right culture generally, um, there's not a lot of ideological co coherence. It's, you know, you're doing it to provoke the lips. You're doing it for the lulls. You're doing it you know, they actually, um, or Putin too, same thing, like there's no ideological coherence to like, we're going to Ukraine to defeat Nazis. Like they just say shit. Um, and it's a big part of contemporary kind of far right and authoritarian culture, almost a gleeful refusal of coherence. So I guess it's just a question about how important uh, is the ideological affinity versus the kind of frenemies relationship of convenience how significant are the ideologically coherent people in terms of threats that we need to worry about versus the kind of provocateurs and gadflies and you have three minutes for this question. sorry yeah. well okay <laughs> well I, I'll, I'll get there um so i totally agree there's opportunism in there however um they have more than just a shared enemy i pointed that out they do have that but um, like it is not eclectic and incoherent. Like, look, you have to like not just look into that into that uh, social media posts and stuff that actually wants should draw people, but look into what um, like the foundations are. And especially with the new far right in Europe, you have people that actually like produce publication on publication that is si very similar to what you see in the early twentieth century in Europe, um, and and like really theorizing that and and like being on the way trying to be research which makes it really dangerous and you have the same with jihadi salafists that there is authors that are really well read and do know what they're talking about have been educated and are just having people who are able to translate their ideas in very simple terms so i would not agree that it's just a like historic coincidence and that brings me back to emmanuel's question if i want to go beyond the parallelity because as you can see i'm just at the beginnings of yeah. that project um so what i hope to find is of course to theorize what these movements have in common to see how that moment in time right makes it possible for these movements to flourish because i think that is also the question of how has society changed to make it possible for these um, social movements to grow um, on the one hand, but um, 
now I have to try to read what I wrote there. <laughs> um, so, yes, um, because that's actually where I want to end up and, and see that, that it's mostly about uh, social challenges and strivers we have in our own societies at home now that are not solved. And this is what they share that basically we're turning away from the fact that we're getting like societies that get more and more unequal um, economically, where like political equality is actually almost not possible anymore. And that, that can be used and abused by these kinds of social movements. Also, as you said, on the extreme left, recently they haven't been very successful. And I'm also curious why that is because they actually were the ones having the best answers for that, like the social question, but they are blending in the background. And what I've been doing before is like in, within those movements, looking at how terrorist groups learn from one another with the Max Planck uh, um, society in Germany. So I wanna expand that to the social movements, how they actually are learning from one another. And um, I, I think that's, um, how they're learning from one another and how they actually keep developing both their ideology but also their strategy and organization and what they both really are able to do is tap into um, people's fears that haven't been politicized or have been politicized differently making their ideas more attractive to them thank you thank you Maria. Fascinating and politically highly important uh, research, but I hope you stay sane looking through all the material over the years. You know, it's, uh, it can be taxing to, to look at these extremists, right? But I very much hope, you know, we see another book of yours coming our way or you coming back first and working here on it. So great having you back, Miriam, and doors always open for you. And yeah, the same. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you, everyone, for your questions and for your time. There were no questions, right? Mm -hmm.